Okay, so we're going to start. Uh, my name is Tom Driscoll. I'm a social studies teacher, uh, author, and speaker out of Putnam uh, High School. Uh, the level up and gamification session, we're going to cover a few different topics from going from theory to classroom applications to uh, what I think the future of this might be. Um, and uh, presenting with me today, Brian Germain, I teach across the hall from him. Uh, my avatar name is O Captain, My Captain. Uh, we'll talk about what exactly an avatar is as we continue through this. But if you know Walt Whitman, if you know Abraham Lincoln, or even Dead Poet Society, you kind of guess what's going on right there. Um, so we're going to start off, everyone, because it's a gamification session, we're going to start off by playing a game. So one of the most uncomfortable things in a session or in a class is when your teacher asks you to do things, and my kids all sit there and they go, oh, we have to do things. So we're asking you to interact. So very first step, I need everyone to stand up. And I think the easiest place to do this would be to form a circle around these two chairs. Now, Tom is going to participate as well because uh, I haven't exactly told Tom what's going on just yet. So if we could circle up, we're going to play a sorting game. And this is how when I need to make groups in my class because this is called gamification. I don't just do it like, okay, you're going to go over here and you're going to go over here. I leave some chance and some randomness and we have some fun, especially with the group very first off. Um, it's a good icebreaker. So form a circle. I'm not part of this game. This game is called Look Up, Look Down. And there's two very simple instructions to this game. They are look up and look down. So when I say look down, you're going to be looking down at the floor. When I say look up, you need to try to look into someone else's eyes, but you do not want that person to see into your eyes. If you make eye contact with the other person, you guys are out. Okay, so the last standing person or the last two, and we have a great way to have tiebreakers, um, you guys will be declared the victors. So I'm going to say look down, I'm going to say look up. You can look at anyone that can be next to you, across to you, does not matter. If you make eye contact, you are out. Any questions? When you're out, what do you do? <coughs> I'm going to split you off into different teams. Anything else? All right, beautiful. So we're looking down. You are south, please come to the office. You are south, please come to the office. Look up. Look down. Look up. Look down. Look up. Uh -oh. <laughs> we got out, we got out. We got out. Uh, you're going to be on this side, you're going to be on this team over here. So we're going to close the circle a little bit. We're going to get closer together. More opportunities looking at our eyes. Look down. Look up. Oh, we're out. <laughs> All right, Tom, we're going to move you over here. We're going to stay over here. So, guys, I don't know how adventurous you are. What's your level of adventure from 1 to 10? That's going to determine eight, the tiebreaker. Eight, I'm an eight, eight. Okay, beautiful. Here's what we're going to do. If you guys had, sorry about that. If you guys had said six, it would be something totally different. But our tiebreaker for eight for adventurous, it's called a vegetable off. Oh my gosh, you guys ever hear of a vegetable off? Nope. This is how they settle uh, tiebreakers at Dartmouth College. So this it's an Ivy League thing. Uh, it starts off with paces. We're going to stand back to back and go three paces. We're going to count them off. One, two, three. On your third pace, you're going to turn. I'm going to say a vegetable. Your job is to take the shape of this vegetable and to try to make the noise that you think this vegetable would make. All right? So there's kind of the abstract thought tied to it. If I say one, two, three, asparagus, you're going to have to turn and like make the sound that you think an asparagus would make. Okay? And the winner is judged by uh, the audience who's watching. You good with that? I remember you said eight for adventure. It would have been different six. Six is rock, paper, scissors. Okay? Anyone have a good vegetable they want to shout out? Because I'm open to suggestions. Oh, okay. why shouldn't I give you that? One, two, three, broccoli. <laughs> John was it, right? Yeah. John, who thinks John's the winner? I got one for John. I would say tie. <laughs> oh, you're pulling up the vegetable off. Tie breaker for the vegetable, vegetable Still rock paper. Who says Nick? It says Nick's the winner for broccoli. All right, I got two for Nick. I have two that abstained, one that voted for John. So wow. you are the victor. Congratulations. Which team would you like to go to? Uh, which team? Let's see here. Yeah. Uh, now we'll, 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 All right, cool, cool, cool. There's too many guys. So you're over here. You're over here. Actually, hey, I'm Brian. Hi, Brian. Nice to meet you. Hi, this is Tommy. Hi, Tommy. session as well. Hi. All right. Hi, we're going to replace you with Tom if that's okay. Yes. Come over to this team. Don't worry. You won't have to act like a vegetable. I you can also get comfortable and take your jacket yeah. off. And yeah, yeah. If you'd like to. If you guys want to, you can kind of sit down and relax. So that's the hard part. It's over. Our icebreaker, we're smiling, we're laughing. That's what I like to get my kids to do. It gets the brain flowing, the juices flowing. Um, so the very first task that I need each team to do, now that you have been divided, 
is you need to make a name for your team. Or actually, we're going to call you guilds. That's how we split off our teams. We call you guilds. So each guild is going to have to come up with their own name. So you can talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to do what I do with my students all the time. You have two minutes to think of a team name that's very clever, a guild name. If you can't think of one in two minutes, i got a couple good ones for you. So a point system has actually already been established. Each team is going to accrue experience points as they go throughout this session. So I have awarded the Rockets one experience point for the sneaky fact that they came up with their guild name first. And Turn Up and Bacon Guild, you have one experience point as well because, well, you won as Mr. Broccoli. So props to you for that, sir. Um, at each of your team station right now is a board with a nail hammered squarely into it. If your nail shakes loose, if there's something wrong, don't worry. Always prepared. Have a box of extras. So what your team is going to do, and you want to try to work so the other guild does not hear what you're doing, your task. You have a bundle of 12 nails on top of this board. Your task with those 12 nails is to get them to balance on this one nail. Nails can only touch other nails. Good luck. Mm -hmm. You guys are about to experience what we call the earthquake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys haven't touched the ground, too. Oh, we can't yeah, yeah, nails can only touch other nails. You guys are about to experience what we call the windfall. <laughs> We're going to return to it later. Um, if I was doing this in class or something like that, I would give more clues as we went along, but you'd have to cash in your accrued points in order to get a clue. So I might say there's certain ways that we could gain points, experience points, and if you guys want a clue, you're going to have to cash in those points. I might say every three points you could cash in to get another clue to figure it out. So what just happened even with a group of adults working on something like this, you guys experience what we call flow. Even when we tried to stop the activity, you were like, no, 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 I got ideas, we're going to keep going, we're going to try to keep building. And that's good. That's what we want our kids to be at every step of the way. Because now they have something they're invested in that they want to complete. And we have something that we're invested in and want to complete <laughs> like this. And now we're going to work together to make both of them happen. So we're going to be throwing out XP if you guys could answer questions, if you have suggestions that you want to offer, connections you want to make. We'll still keep the XP leaderboard going. We'll accrue tallies as we go throughout. And hopefully you could trade those points in for clues so you don't leave here at the end of the night not knowing this. This is really fun. I'll tell you what, this was Thanksgiving for me like five years ago. I brought it to my family Thanksgiving, sat them all around tables and had them compete who could get it the fastest. It's great. It beat the heck out of talking politics. How do you do it? It usually happens. I can't tell you. We got to accrue XP and figure it out by the end of the session. Good point. So that's where we're going with it. All right, good. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, the first. Uh, First thing we'll talk about is what does it mean to gamify a classroom? And a lot of people have a misconception about what that means. They think it just means taking a game and playing it in class. Uh, so we'll talk about the meaning of it. We'll talk about why you should gamify it. And Brian's going to take the lead on that. Uh, we'll discuss our request into this. Okay, so the pastor may hey, invite you. Sorry. Guys. No, it's okay. Yeah, just... Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So our quest uh, is, you know, me and uh, that's one of our colleagues. So. <laughs> We do it slightly differently, but the same basic uh, concept of how we gamified uh, our world history classes. We'll discuss how we do that. Uh, then managing gamification, if you want to try it, what are some practical strategies to do that? Some results we've seen, uh, but also some student viewpoints. We put together a quick uh, six-minute video from a student's perspective, what they think of it, how it works, and, and also I, I gave them some space to give us critiques and how we could make it better. Uh, some of them ran with that. And then the next level, where I think we could go with this. Okay, we're not quite there yet, but the technology exists. It's there, it's just we haven't really applied to education yet, so I'll end with some of that uh, augmented reality. Okay, so the question that, that me and Brian had to consider when we started this, and all, uh, all educators should consider is, how can we leverage the motivational power of games? Okay, how, can we motivate, uh, how can we use this motivational power to create environments that engage kids and enhance learning? Okay, we know kids like games, adults like games. It's motivating. What do a lot of students lack in school? Motivation. It's hard to learn if you're not motivated. So how can we harness this power of games to motivate to, to teach people better? And you guys just had a vegetable off. And I know 
You were laughing during that. You were having fun, even though you were secretly like, oh man, this is stupid. But when your arms went up and you did broccoli and you made that noise, I saw the chuckles come out. So that was good stuff. Um, what does it mean to actually gamify? When we say we're going to gamify the classroom, well, we're going to take principles that we see in the most engaging video games because that's what it's all about. If we can engage students, if we can get them in that flow that you guys were in when you were trying to stack nails or, or tilt nails, however you're trying to balance them on, on that top nail, that's what we're trying to do. And we're going to use the principles of video games to make that happen. Now first, disclaimer. Tom and I are not what you would call video game nerds. Um, we talked about this beforehand. I grew up with Tetris and I own like a Nintendo 64, but I grew up on, on Mario and I haven't played a video game in years. So you don't necessarily have to be someone who sits in front of a computer and plays World of Warcraft for 15 hours a day to be successful at using the motivational techniques that video games offer to motivate your students. So that's just a disclaimer up front. Um, we're going to use gamification to use immediate reinforcement to get kids kind of to do what we want. So a simple example is our experience points that we already started accruing, our leaderboard that we already have start starting to go, a simple task that we're already starting to become invested in, um, and we're going to go throughout and talk a lot more about badges and collaboration and the strategies <coughs> that video games use that we could actually use in our real live action role play classroom. So if you are into, thank you, um, does anyone know what these are called? Very badges. Yeah. What's that? Badges. Well, we have badges up here, like these word clouds, word clouds yeah. or wordles. wordles. Wordles is a pretty cool website. If you want to make something like this, you can punch in all the information, all the words that you want, and it'll kind of design it like this. Um, so if you're into wordles, this is all what gamification is about. Everything we're going to say and talk about tonight is really, that's your one word cloud for it. Um, so why are we interested in gamifying? Well, the very first reason is because games are fun. Games are engaging. We want our students to learn a lot, and in order to do that, we're trying to make learning fun for them. Um, and I actually just, just saw this on the desk. Teachers who love teaching teach children to love learning. And that's what we're all about. We're trying to teach kids to love learning, to get them to be curious, and, and games are going to help us out with that. So if we look at all research and brain-based learning, um, Basically, brain-based learning takes an evolutionary standpoint from the psychology of the human mind. That there's a natural flow and order of how your mind actively learns things. And if we don't inhibit the natural process of how the mind is wired to operate, then learning is going to happen. We just don't want to stand in its way. So think about uh, back to cavemen, back to the competitions they had to try to get their food, to try to secure a mate. It was all about competition. It was all about trying to do something to outmaneuver someone else. And so we're trying to apply that in the classroom, brain-based learning. What we don't want to do is kind of have this last a long time, this lecture series, because humans aren't wired for that. Kids are not learning in history classes where teachers, this is my high school history teacher. He'd alternate staring at corners of the wall as he walked back and forth and just lectured. And that wasn't fun for me to learn. I actually learned to hate history. I became a history teacher in spite of him to try to do it the right way. And this is what we feel is the right way, to actively engage someone um, and turn things into a game. Because once you get a game rolling, it's going to lead to mastery learning. Kids are going to want to perfect things. I'm thinking back to those days when I played Mario. Any Mario players in here? Somebody referenced it a lot. I got really, really mad when I tried to jump over that green pipe and instead I fell in a hole. I, I didn't just quit and give up there. You start the level over again, you know next time you're going to have to like press the Y button so he runs fast before you jump. And then you're going to get over that pit and not fall in. And this is what we're going to see in the classroom. It's going to lead to mastery where a kid is going to attempt something over and over again until they get it right. And that's what we want. That's beautiful. That's exactly what we want to happen in the classroom. Gamification also holds true the theory, the axiom, that students, um, sorry, students, yeah, teachers don't give grades, students earn them. Sorry, I thought I had that backwards. Um, a lot of times, kids are very inclined to come up to teachers, especially around report card time. What were you doing giving me a D? Why did you give me a C in your class? How come you didn't give me an A? And that's not what we're all about. <laughs> students are earning them. They're going through a mission, and they're accruing points. And the natural order of things is, when that report card comes out, that's what you earned. 
and you saw every step of the way as you slowly built and earned points. And gamification with the leaderboards we're going to show you makes it a lot easier for students to track their progress and be accountable for their learning. And this is all what we see in video games. Um, I think very last point is this is really what we owe to our kids. Mistakes happen. They happen often. Think of this warm, nurturing environment, these walls, this classroom, these beautiful, bright lights, the pictures around here. This is where we want them to make the mistakes. And it's okay. If you make a mistake, you start over. It's just like Mario falling into that pit, or running into that little Koopa, or having one of those guys throw a hand at your head. You respawn. You try over again. You start off in the beginning of the level, or if it's a game where the level had checkpoints, you start off at the last checkpoint you made it to. And we're fine with that, because that's going to lead to mastery. That's going to lead to a love of learning. So let's get a little deeper into games. In 2002, why 2002? This is the last year I could find data for, and I just kind of screen captured this from a YouTube video that we shared with you um, on a previous link. If anyone has seen um, Shift Happens, that link is up there in the 2013 version, kind of talking about how the world is changing very rapidly. So here's some data for you. In 2002, Nintendo invested more than $140 million in research and development. Any thoughts on how much the United States Department of Education invested in researching new technologies and innovation? In 2002? In 2002, that very same year. Probably a tenth of that or less. A tenth or less. Any other thoughts? <coughs> so I got a guess from my rockets over here. Turn up in Bacon Guild. You want to venture a guess? $25 million. All right, you, you guys know where we're going because you all lowballed it. So I'm glad we're on the same page. It's actually about $65 million, less than half as much. Okay? So Nintendo is spending more money on research and improving their product than American education is spent on uh, spending money on improving and researching their products, which is kind of crazy because when you look at it, also clips from this film clip, Shift Happens, the top 10 in-demand jobs in 2010, they didn't even exist in the year 2004. So what this means for us as educators is we're currently preparing students for jobs that don't even exist yet. We're using technologies. They're going to be using technologies in their jobs that haven't even been invented yet. So they can solve problems that we don't even realize right now are problems yet. So we're trying to stay current. We're trying to stay with the latest research, with what we know works, with what can engage kids. I'm going to take a stance here. I have people frequently ask me, what's the goal of education? I've had principals ask me. I've had grad students who are writing papers ask me. Um, can anyone take a guess from what this picture is? Curiosity. Curiosity. If nothing else, I want my kids to leave my room curious every day. At the end of the year, I want them to be curious to learn, to fill this vessel that they have in their mind. Because I teach US history. If you look around this room, there's so much. The curriculum grows by one day every single day that passes. It's growing infinitely faster than I could keep up with. So if I could teach my kids to be curious, if I give them the tools to motivate them, to empower them, I think I've done my job. And gamification is really going to help us do this. So we're going to talk about um, another game, Super Smash Brothers, up here. This was created really for the N64. It's come out in a lot of other gaming systems. Um, but games. The very best games, the ones that are, are played the most, that gross the most income, they have challenges embedded in them, in them. They have hidden levels. They have things where, if you're familiar with Super Smash Brothers, they have this level called Break the Targets, where Yoshi might go through and you're trying to battle other characters, and then all of a sudden you get to this one level. And there's no characters for you to battle. There's just targets for you to break in a certain amount of time. So we try to embed things like this into our classroom with hidden challenges where we figure out what a kid needs and when he needs it. And boom, there we are with that challenge. With that obstacle that he thinks is insurmountable, we're going to scaffold him and help him up a little bit and build his own proximal development. Because we want to make sure that they stay curious. And this is going to help us out with that. So. I talked about challenges that are coming your way out of nowhere. We build our gamified classrooms into levels that you could follow, much the same way that if you had an instructional guide that came with a video game, you could kind of track where the levels are, what's coming next. You may even see screen captures or shots of what the level looks like. At the end of all my levels, I have a challenge. I want my kids to be invested. So if we're going through, and it looks like this is about business competition and kids working, laboring in the industrial era, 
I'm going to get my kid a challenge on this that they're interested in. So as they've gone through, they've been taking notes, they've been asking questions. Well, guess what? One of those questions you asked throughout the unit, throughout our mission, you're going to tell me the answer. You're going to teach me. It's empowering. It helps them out with their curiosity. And it lets them know, hey, I know where to go to find the answers to this. I could overcome these challenges. All right. Thanks, Brad. Our quest to, uh, to get to the point that we're at today. Okay, this, this didn't just happen you know, over in August. Okay, it, this was a few years in the making. The first step for both of us was that in 2011, I believe it was, we started to experiment with the primary concept. It used to be known as the flip classroom uh, uh, approach. Uh, who's familiar with the flip class? Okay. Yeah, in general, it's just shifting, and I know everybody you know, the first time they hear about this, it's this misconception that it's just video lectures for homework. It's not about that. Uh, so what, what, what we did is we started to take some of our direct instruction, our lectures, and we started to archive it online and move it out of the group learning space and into the individual space, whether it's at home or in classroom or wherever it may be. That way we could have more time to innovate in our classroom with our kids. Okay, so we took our his, any historical lecture or technology tutorial or assignment instructions, we made video archives of it. Okay, put them all there, and we realized we have so much more time now to work with our kids to an experiment. That's when we moved to a mastery system. We said, okay, well, since we started to archive our direct instruction, let's try to work towards mastery. Okay, so then we set up a mastery system with different objectives. They worked through the objectives, uh, to, and they had to master them before they moved on. And that's when, when you know, I actually remember saying this uh, a couple of years when we first started mastery. Wouldn't it be cool to make this into a game? Because I recognize that it's already set up into level. There's a lot of parallels here. So over the summer, I was uh, presenting at a conference in New York, uh, the Games and Ed Symposium, and I met Lee Sheldon. He was presenting there. He's a professor at RPI, and he actually worked in a previous career as a game designer. And he was the one that wrote the narratives for the stories to try to get people engaged in the thing like World of Warcraft or something along those lines. Then he became a professor, and that's his book right there, the multiplayer class, and he designed his college courses at Rensselaer in a, as a live action multiplayer game which was not online, actually. He didn't use much technology at all. It was a live action game. And I spoke to him about this uh, after the session. And I said, do you know of any high school teachers who do this? Uh, and he said, no. He said, I don't even know any college teachers. And so I didn't really have anyone to, to bounce ideas off of. But he did say that, look, if you already have a mastery system, then it's not that big of a loop if you want to try gamifying it. So we did some research on it. I collaborated with Brian towards the end of the summer. And then we started to put together some game design principles. So what I'm going to do now is go through uh, how we gamified our classes, some of the different elements of it, and then Brian's going to chime in with, with his take on it. They're, they're similar, but we do have slightly different ways that we do it. Okay, the first, uh, well, I'm just going to go through the mechanics quickly and then in a little bit more detail. We have a live action multiplayer game is the setup of it. It's not something you go on a computer to do. Uh, it is live action. We are a part of the game every day. Think of it more as like a year-long simulation, okay, as opposed to just a game that you play. We also use gamified terminology. We changed up a lot of the things that, that we had still do, but we just changed what we call it. We have a leveling system. We have badges and achievements, points through attrition uh, with XP points, leaderboards, team missions, and what I've started to incorporate is a narrative to the whole year and avatars. Okay, so the first thing is the terminology, and uh, Brian, you make the point about verbs. Yeah, I think this is the easiest thing to do in order to gamify your classroom. It, the first change needs to be just switch up the lingo that you use. So instead of kids coming in and saying, hey, today we're going to talk about um, Ulysses S. Grant and what he did for the United States, because we're making a live action game, I want my kids in there. So the first unit I start off with is the Industrial Revolution. So my kids are told, you are going to expand United States industry. We're not learning about expanding United States industry. You are going to do it. You are going to expand the industry in the United States in the early 1800s. And here's how we could do that. We're going to learn from our robber barons, from our captains of industry, how they syndicated oil companies and brought together and monopolized and beat out the competition. And you're going to do that. You're going to monopolize and you're going to beat the competition. And you are going to be that business person. So it's, putting the, it's empowering them through verbs, saying that the action is on them. You're not just going to sit back and take a passive role and learn about it and have words thrown at your face. You're going to do it. So this really starts off encouraging higher level blooms. It's not you're going to remember and understand at the bottom of the pyramid. It's you're going to apply, you're going to create, you're going to value, you're going to synthesize. You are going to be in charge of this mission. 
it, and then leveling up is why you achieve this mission. We'll get to that later. That's just the term that we use for once you've mastered it, uh, you've leveled up to the next scenario, the next mission. The missions and scenario guides, we'll talk about that. That's just re uh, terminology for our, our units. Okay, uh, for me, I call each scenario, each one of my units, for have ancient Greece and Rome scenario. And then I have missions within that. I think Ryan's is slightly different, but same concept that we just changed the idea of, of assignments to missions and we change units to scenarios. So even just that quick focus, a kid hears that you're on mission three, you're in level two, instead of saying, oh, this is unit three and this is lesson two, they're like, oh, all right, this is gonna be a little cooler. And instantly we were just able to pull them in just by changing words, which I didn't think it was gonna be that simple, but it's honestly the simplest thing that I've ever done in education that yielded the most results, just changing a couple words. Yeah, I, was, I was skeptical about that as well, but I've, I've seen it too. My class is just changing the terminology. You'd be so surprised by how much that helps. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to the feedback later on. Sure. Uh, all right, so leveling. Let's start with that. I took my units. Okay, and it, I already had gone to a mastery system, so this wasn't as much of a change, but I, just, I, I made units where I had about eight to ten levels. In each level, I had certain performance objectives tagged to those levels. So for instance, the first mission in this scenario, scenario Aging Greece and Rome, this is just a screenshot of the LMS that we're using. The mission is here, and then that was, this is the particular mission, these are the assignments for level one. It has links to all the assignments, it has the XP that's available for each, and then as they demonstrate mastery and level up, they just go through this slider, moving all the way through to the 10th level in the scenario. The other thing we do is we, uh, at the end of each scenario, I award badges and achievements for certain uh, things and I'm going to change that up each unit. But I have uh, I had an innovator badge that I gave to Jacob, uh, the Tech Ninja Award, the kid that is the most innovative with tech use. Um, this this kid Sean actually says how you know he, he hates uh, certain operating systems, so he rigs his computer differently so that he can change what when it happens. Kind of but anyway, I gave him the Tech Ninja Award, high score for XP, a team score, uh, emerging leader and collaborators. So I'm just going to come up with different badges that I give to the kids. Um, and there's going to be digital ones, but I'm also going to keep them in the room just so that people can physically see who got these achievements. And if you don't know what XP is, because honestly, I started off this journey, this quest in gamification, and I kept reading the word XP, and I'm like, what the heck is this? It's just short for experience points. It's something you accrue through your experience and learning. Yeah, and, you, and you get to determine what determines mastery. So say, for instance, what you so, some people have said to me, oh, XP is so arbitrary. Said, well, so, so is the number that you give a kid. Okay, if you just say 70 or 80, that's arbitrary. But if you tie it to performance objectives, you say uh, 80, 80 XP demonstrates proficiency. However you determine that XP, but you still have some type of rating scale or some type of rubric, you can put whatever XP you want. Okay, as long as you're, you're making it and scaling it correctly. Okay, it's just like anything else that you would use for percentages. But one tip is try to go higher. It's a lot cooler to get 270 XP than you know, so like, even though it didn't change much, really, the kids just for some reason like having, oh, I got 2,800 points in scenario one. Yeah, it's a good point. Let's yeah. level up with the XP. Let's hey, run you know. four extra Here for we you. Go. Um, one of the things I'm starting to do in my class as well, because I teach U.S. history, and I want my kids to know what the difference between a general is, what the difference between a captain is. So when we read about World War One, we read about World War Two, and we hear about heroic endeavors of soldiers in the war, they know, oh, when the captain did this, they could picture what the rank is. So my badge system is starting to move towards paralleling the United States Army. So whether you're enlisted or you're an officer, you completed that first mission, congratulations. You just got promoted, you're now my first lieutenant. Next mission, you successfully completed, you achieved this number of XP, you've now gotten your promotion to captain. Congratulations. And the kids like that because they're going to start roving around the room. And I have a kid right now who's my first lieutenant, only one in the class so far. And, and what he does is he kind of moves around and consults. And he's like, oh, I've already been there. I know that. I know how to run that mission. And he's going to help other people out, which is cool. Okay, XP points, points to attrition. That just means that instead of averaging it out, you have a, a leaderboard where people build up. And then at the end of each unit, I'll explain more how I, I do the official grading with this. I have a conversion chart. So for instance, you need 850 XP in the scenario to get an A+. Plus. And again, you can design that however you'd like. You can do the percentages however you'd like. But again, it's just that concept of accruing points throughout instead of just averaging everything. And this is actually a very motivational uh, tool that we use. The leaderboard. This is something that I try to keep up. All right. Oh. The leaderboard, this is for individuals. I actually have a, um, a Google form that I set up that I track all of these uh, points. And I go through the scenarios at different levels. And the way it works, this is updated in real time. Okay, through this 
spreadsheet. They have access to it, so they can see exactly where they are at all times in relation to their peers and also where their teams are. Okay, so for instance, in this scenario, there were 855 possible XP points. Okay, 780 was the leader at this point that I took the screenshot. Okay, so they were at the top of the leaderboard. Okay, there are a lot of different ways that you can manage this, but that's the way that, that I had set it up. You can also do uh, competitions with a leaderboard with each team. So I had each team in all of my US history classes uh, in, in this particular uh, graph. I also had a, t a class versus class competition. So they could see uh, where they were in relation to the other classes as it compiled into the spreadsheet. I also had different collaborative team missions. Okay, Brian's done this as well. I'll let him speak to it in a second. But one of them is the, the review basketball game that I have. Um, you know, I just tried to gamify that a little bit more than it already is. So each team would have a, a Google form that they made a copy of and shared with me, and I would just put them all up on my screen. And I would have them post responses in. It's kind of like my own way of making a student response system just using Google Forms. And I would just track it, and we and they wouldn't see the screen, only I would. And so then I would go around and i know what each person And I would just use that as a competition to gain bonus XP points at the end of each scenario. Another thing that I did at the end of each scenario is it's part of the narrative that I use, but they have to have a report to mission control. That's really just like the summative assessment. They have to take a step back, work as a team, and actually post a blog post that they share with me about their missions. Now, this is the part that uh, I'm still working on, but I've been told, and you're going to see in a second by students primarily, that it would really help with the motivational factor of this is making a narrative. And Sheldon, that he was really going on and on about this at the, uh, at the session that he was at, is having a storyline. And if you actually have a storyline and a narrative to your game, kids get a lot more invested in it. So I gave it a shot. Okay? And I am not an a, a expert in writing these scripts, but I decided that I'm going to make my class based in 2045. Okay. Should we go like Hold on, I'm setting the scene for you. 2045. 2045. <laughs> okay. There's no electricity. Okay. Um, and I'm saying that you know there's a post-apocalyptic theme to it that the United States is still surviving, but there's a small group that has to come together and decide how do we make a blueprint for the new society. And the way they make this blueprint is by studying these five great civilizations. And uh, I, I have this other part of the narrative where the scientists and tech leaders have created this augmented reality system where they go in and they can actually go and experience in real time what the times were like. And they have to report back to mission control at the end of each scenario what they learned from that particular time period. And at the end of the year, they are going to create a blueprint. Okay, for if you were going to create a new society from scratch, how would you do it? And that's going to be like their final presentation at the end of the year. As they go through this narrative, they all have their own avatars. So they're able to create their own character. And I created a list of avatar classes like general, judge, politician, doctor, uh, civilian. And they got to have certain skills, expertise, and a backstory. And I refer to them in the class, I'm still trying to get their new names down, uh, but as, as these avatars. Okay. And the kids, some of them say that's kind of silly. They want to add new ones. They're like, all right, make a new avatar class. Go for it. And what I'm going to try to do is, based on what their expertise is, that would be what, if we have a team competition, they would be focused on doing. Okay. So if we had any different tasks that we would have, we would split it up that way. All right. So anything else to add on the game aspects? Just with the avatars, that's why some kids call me, oh, Captain, my captain, because that's my avatar. It's not the name of that. Well, I assume the presidency. I am the president in the, in the role in the blueprint, so I just, I just call myself the president. It's President Driscoll, though. <laughs> I'll never call you that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, managing gamification. Okay, actually, for your highlighter, you probably recognize this crazy case there. But that's the one that was long to me this year. Um, but it's, that's probably one of the biggest... Uh, challenges for teachers that want to try this is if is how do you manage the mastery system? And this isn't just particular to gamification. It's just anytime you move towards a mastery concept, uh, managing it and, and doing the day-to-day -day workflow and making it all run smoothly uh, is is somewhat tricky. So we start out with mission guides, and I used to do this with my mastery class anyway. We just changed the terminology, but uh, me and Brian hand this out. We don't hand it out. We share the document uh, through Google Drive. They have this. It's rooted in a mastery system where these used to be objectives. And they actually used to be specific language from the Common Core and the Connecticut State Standards. They still match those. But I thought over the summer, it's like, is there anything more demoralizing than a kid saying, oh, today I'm going to learn Common Core Standards, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, snooze fast. I don't, I don't want to like offend anybody if you do that. 
But that is not going to engage a kid. If you said, we're going to learn CCSS 2.5, blah, blah, today. So like, oh, Jesus. You know, but if you say, this is your mission today, a little more engagement. Even if it does hit that standard, just don't say it. Okay? They don't have to know what the number standard is. So I took all of those standards and I just reworded it. And I actually had the kids help me with that. I said, like, you guys are gamers. Help me reword the standards so it's more like a mission. Then I took the type of assignment. Is it a solo assignment or a team assignment? All of their tasks. So again, I have a flipped classroom, so I put all of my instructional videos here. They're linked. All the quizzes are linked. And then I have an XP available. I've since changed the way this is set up because as I was doing some more reading and research, I found out that having a lot of tasks at the early levels is not smart. It's actually better to have fewer tasks and fewer missions at the beginning so you level up quicker at the start so that you start to, to do it. Like something about Angry Birds doesn't start with the hardest one. It's really easy to get people hooked onto it, to get them to get interested. So now I actually have just XP available, just maybe 30 for just one quiz, and then they move up to level two. So now instead of leveling off after a week, they maybe do it after 20 minutes. And that's another engaging factor to it. The learning map. So what you just saw was our educational learning map, and here's why we do it, and here's why it makes sense in the world of gamification. I'm going to go back to my favorite game, Mario, and this is from Super Mario Brothers 3. What they have is a map of where you can go. You get to see in the world, once I beat the first level, I get to move on to the second level, and then there's a mushroom hut where I could go for rewards after that. I could cash in some of my XP that I've accrued, some of that star power. Then I can move on to level three. And you're even going to see that there's a challenge waiting for me. And I see where that is, where that challenge is coming. And I let kids know in their levels where their challenges are going to be. They just don't know exactly what it is. And sometimes there's hidden parts of the map too, like this cloud land. But even once you get there, you can kind of see where you're going. It's a map where kids can understand once I complete this level, this objective, I'm going to move on to the next one. And then you can see where the castle is, too. That's where the level boss is. At the end of our level, instead of just calling it a test, they're going to have to defeat the level boss, which, based on what we decide, might be some type of different assessment. It might be writing. It might be an oral presentation. It might be inquiry-based. The kid is going to decide how they prove their mastery of a certain skill. Okay, uh, progress monitoring. This is a video that we're going to show you quick, quick, um, the lights. This is something that we started this year, and actually it was, it was Brian's idea. It's awesome. We use the smart board. It's very quick and easy. We have all of the students put their names, or we put all the students' names in the absent column. As they come into class, they have to swipe their name to the appropriate column. So one of the columns is, uh, is that first one? Uh, I need assistance need immediately. And we kind of lined it up to parallel a traffic light. We're trying to seamlessly make this as, as easy as possible. So if you have no clue what you're doing that day and you need to talk to the teacher right off the bat, you're going to swipe in the interactive smart board. You're just going to move your name to the red. If you kind of know what you're doing, but you think you're going to need assistance soon or have a couple questions, you're going to need some coaching, you're going to move yourself into the yellow. If you know exactly what needs to get done, you just need to beat that level, complete that mission. You need to be completely independent, and you don't even want me to bother you right off the bat because you just need to get to it. You're going to swipe in and move your name to the green. And that lets us know immediately where you are, and it helps you refocus and self-assess. Again, uh, quickly, how we, we uh, get to have a quick glimpse of where the class is at, who needs help. And we try to really reinforce that you know, there should be a stigma with putting your name in that red column. We found out very quickly some students weren't putting their name there because they thought that it made them look you know, dumb or, or that they needed extra help. But once we kind of said, no, this is really just, if you want us to help you immediately, 
put it there, and that's going to help you. But it's more just a way for you to, uh, to monitor your own progress, but let us know how we can help. So one of the things we're both a huge fan of is how we get kids to use more technology. In fact, in Flipping 2.0, that's what we wrote our chapter in the book on, how to actually get kids to use the technology. So when we saw students swiping in, that's what it's all about for us, to, to empower the kids to actually use the technology. And you can see some of the kids already, this was early on in the year, but they really like it. Especially when they figured out that you could touch your name and you could flip it across and it'll be kind of like a game of Pong and it'll bounce back. And they're going to try to land it in that middle column by swiping in super hard and having it bounce back and hopefully stop in the yellow. And if it doesn't work, they're going to try again. And that's okay because that's what gaming is all about. But yeah, yeah, a lot of these kids, there's smart boards in every classroom and they get to my class software and they've never actually touched the smart board. So it just shows that the smart board is not being used properly if it's only being used for direct instruction. Okay, there should be other ways that they use it. All right, another way that we try to manage this is we have, uh, and this really came it rooted in the mastery system. I was like, how do I manage mastery? So last year we came up with this sheet. It's called the Mission Frog, the Mission Rundown, which is a better name. I'm going to steal Brian's name for it. But every day we have a daily XP response or a warm-up. It's like a warm-up question, anticipatory set, but they get XP for it. Okay, so if they get that question right, they get points. Then they have to monitor their progress. They have to tell me what level they're on and how many XP they have. Okay, so right off the bat, they're checking their own progress. The second thing they do is they set a goal. They have to let me know what level you're working on, what mission are you working on. That way I can see, you know, it, I can even group them possibly based on what level they're working on. And then lastly, they reflect. Okay, so I'm really big on and when they come into class, they've got to monitor their progress, set goals, and reflect on their learning. Okay, so this is the reflection part where they have to uh, just gauge how much effort they put into it, their behavior, but also what did they achieve that day? Not just what did you do. Uh, but what did you achieve in class? What level did you achieve? What assignments? So I finished level one, or I finished three paragraphs in level one. And then the other important component, too, I want to make sure that each day um, my students leave with a, a new original thought, a fun fact, some new learning that took place. And I always demand that they're specific on this. Don't just tell me, oh, I learned who Andrew Carnegie was. No, 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 we're better than that. We're specific learners. I learned that Andrew Carnegie sold his steel company to J.P. Morgan for $480 million. That's beautiful. That's specific learning. Congratulations. Thank you for reporting to Mission Control. OK, uh, the other part of tech integration is we use the edu on go LMS. It's a new LMS that's just rapidly getting better every single day. And Luckily, we have a relationship with the, uh, the designers there, and we can give them feedback. And one thing that they've done is nice is they've changed the interface in a way that we can set up our sessions uh, and our modules. And you saw a glimpse of the slider before that. It's easy to manage uh, how the kids work through this gamified class. Uh, so again, you have a screenshot here of the scenarios. Uh, they have a discussion forum, but you can also work your way down from the leaderboard, achievements, avatars, tech skills, but also down to the different scenarios. Uh, this is a, another screenshot of the LMS. This is just right from the screen. This picture isn't, but these videos are videos that I created for that first um, first uh, scenario. So this is my early Greek civilization, classical Greece. This was all under the first level. They can click on that. Another nice thing about that is they can do live video notation. So at certain points in that video, they can in the comment box ask a question, and then when I'll get feedback, when that part of the video pops up, their, their comment will pop up for questions. Whether at that point in the video they had, they didn't know or they had a question or comment. Uh, and this has been extremely helpful, but one, one thing to consider is access issues. Is YouTube blocked or not? Is Vimeo blocked or not? We have this crazy system where you know it's not blocked for us, but it's blocked for them. So I, I can go in and show them, but I have to put my password in, which isn't safe, of course. So we use Vimeo. Or at least I, I've been using Vimeo, uh, which is okay, but it has some glitches. We just have to find out ahead of time what the kids have access to. Tom, can you actually go back yeah. a slide real quick yep. to the previous one before yeah, this? this one. Yeah. Um, does anyone know what an LMS actually is? What it stands for? It is an acronym. Learning management system. You want to take that turn up in Bacon Gill? Beautiful. Learning That's where you solve 5 XP. Congratulations. Your experience is up, nice. going through the roof every second. Um, does anyone notice something that is maybe not spelled in the traditional way on this screenshot? <laughs> Skills. Skills. Very good. Turn up in Bacon Gill again, I'm racking up the experience. Mm -hmm. Why do you reckon? Now, now, Tom is a very smart and literate man. I promise you that. Why the heck do you think he spelled it with a Z? Any ideas? Tom, why do you spell it with a Z? <laughs> Great question. I've been asking my kids, that, and I, I'm, I'm trying to learn this myself. There's a whole gamer terminology and language out there 
that I don't really know, but they do. I think the term was leaked speak or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something crazy. But it looks they, like this. It stands for like yeah, leaked. Yeah, so I'm trying to learn the game, gamer terminology and trying to incorporate in the class. I'm not very good at it. Yeah, so Tom's having some trouble because yeah. he's what gamers call a noob. I'm a noob. Yes, and that stands for Gooby, I guess, someone that doesn't know what to do with the gaming, but uh, each day I'm trying to incorporate more of that language into into this. One thing that, that uh, Lee Sheldon proposed to do for badges is, what was it, waste of rations? We're not going to use that one. Um, but there are other, who does not think they get the waste of rations. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's a little... That's me. But, um, but there are certain gamer uh, terms that for, for different things that people are good at. Like, say, in Warcraft, someone's really good at like getting a group together, defeating some... Mob boss, or it's called. They have certain names for it. We're trying to add that into our classes. All right. Uh, the other thing is, I, I try to make, and this is the tech skills. I try to make videos that don't just intro content. Uh, I've been trying to start making a lot of tech tutorial videos of things that I think my kids would need that would help them get through all this. Um, for instance, Google Drive. I use that for everything. So I made a, a, a bunch of quick one to two minute videos on how to use Google Drive, how to use Blogger. I've actually found that a lot of teachers find my videos more helpful than students do, but uh, this is where I put all those into LMS. And again, tech integration. If you're not a Google Apps school, you should use it anyway. Uh, I've, I've been leaning on our district to go to Google Apps for a while, but it's not working. But I use it with our class. We just have the kids make a personal account. They have their, their Google Drive set up with us. We share documents. Uh, it just becomes a lot easier to manage the classroom when you go to Google Apps. And here's what we've been learning. We talked with Nick earlier um, in the night about this. That here's how we know our kids like gamification, the tech integration that we're doing, because they're asking other teachers to do the same thing. An English teacher started catching on and using Google Apps and Google Documents because the kids go to them and say, well, how come you're not using Google Documents? And the kids will turn to each other. Um, a couple days ago in a computer lab, um, someone kicked a computer, it got unplugged, and someone was typing on Microsoft Word, and they lost everything they were working on. And the kid just turns and says, how come you weren't using Google Documents? Like it saves every two seconds. And they're like, oh, OK, I'm going to do that next time. So it's it's starting to spread out. The movement is starting to spread. Yeah, some other options are you can use a blog, you can use wikis, websites, any LMS you want. But the, uh, you would need some type of tech integration to really manage this class. And we have this, this, uh, you can share this presentation with you guys if you want to get access to all these links. All right, uh, empowerment. So I talked about how I have my students, their kind of badges are military ranks. So here is my first lieutenant over here, just sipping a coffee because sometimes supervisors do that. This is, in fact, a student in my class. And what he's doing is this other student right here, integrating tech skills. He has a calculator. He has a tutorial on how to solve an ethic train math problem. Yes, I teach US history, but I also do a lot of cross-content stuff. So we're talking industrial revolution and trains being built. How did the epic train problem come up to be, oh, a train leaves this uh, point A at this time, traveling this speed, another train leaves point B, traveling at this time, at this speed. When do they meet? Well, this problem arose because this actually used to happen. Trains used to crash before they had a standardized rail schedule that the railroads actually created. They set time zones so this wouldn't happen. So we're going over an example of a math problem like this. My first lieutenant has already been through this. He has proven that he has mastered this. So now what he is doing is he's helping my private first class figure this out. Okay, So he's, he's empowered because he knows what he's doing. He's not giving them the answer, but he's coaching them through it. And so um, I think the best way that I learn personally and the, the way you retain the most information is through teaching. I could read something, I'll forget 90% of it the next day. But if I teach something, that's when I really learn it. So we can see a couple of examples of other people in my class um, through coaching, through empowerment, um, kids working together at the board. And I suggest you could kind of see we're a little bit behind the tech eight ball because I have a, a chalkboard. Ooh, I kind of quiver at that. So what I've started to do, um, and kids really like it, if you have a chalkboard and you don't have a whiteboard in your room, is I actually use the windows. So kids are writing on there and taking notes, and they just think it's the coolest thing in the world. Now, I thought it was pretty cool and novel at first. I got over it in about a day. But they still come in every day. New kids come in. They're like, is that writing on the windows? Oh my gosh, there's notes up there. And so they really like that. And kids are working together through an engineering challenge right here. So I told you we're in the Industrial Revolution. So they had a MacGyver type challenge. They said, we're interested in engineering and, and how people figured out certain inventions to complete certain tasks. 
So I set up a lava pit in my classroom. You can see the caution tape right here. Past this rug is the lava, and on the other far end is a desk. My keys were on that desk. They were given a bag of goodies and a time limit. They had to figure out how they can manufacture an object that could yank the keys off the desk and safely bring them back across the lava using what we learned in US history. Okay, pacing is going to be uh, something you'll have to grapple with. We take slightly different approaches on it. In, in my mastery system, I use a self paced unit structure. Okay, so they go self paced through the units. Each mission that they complete is graded. Missions that are not completed are, are not entered as a zero. Okay, they're just uh, exempt from that. 50% of their final unit assessment is based on that XP total that I used the grade conversion for. And then the other 50% is that mission control report. And the entire class begins the next unit simultaneously. Okay, so that's just the way that I've structured it. Uh, and Brian's done it slightly differently. The couple of changes I've made is um, my kids are going at their own pace 100% both throughout the year. Um, we're not beginning the next unit simultaneously. Um, something I kind of grappled with, I don't, I don't want them to feel the pressure to, oh, there's two weeks left and I have three missions, I'm never going to be able to do it and kind of shut down or produce lesser quality work. Um, where I student taught, um, it's called High School in the Community in New Haven. They were in the news a lot for uh, a lot of reforms that they made for education and um, revolutionary teacher contracts that got Barack Obama and Arnie Duncan's attention as well. They do it like this. It's about competencies. It's about mastering concepts. It's not about seat time. If you master something, you move on to the next level. And if you don't, it's going to take a little bit longer. So you could go through the classes at that high school, and you could graduate in three years if you're super motivated. And if you're not, it might take you five years. That's OK. We move at slower paces. But you're going to show mastery in a subject before you move on. And we're doing this every step of the way with gamification in our flipped classes. It's not we're going to wait, wait till report card time and figure out, oh my gosh, you failed. No, if, if you fail anything, if you fail a learning task, if you jump down that hole like Mario did, you're just going to start that level over again. And we're not going to wait till the mission or the semester is over. And so I'm currently talking with administration at my school. We're going through a process of grading reform. So I'm trying to get it where kids are moving self-paced if they don't finish everything that our curriculum says they need to finish by the end of the year, they get more time. They oh, have to go the take report to the lobby. So what? They need more time. I don't care if they need more time. They learn at a different pace. What I'm worried about is that they leave my class with the skills to have a good life and curiosity. Okay, so some results. First, we'll start with some of the challenges we face. Managing the mastery learning. You mentioned some of these. Uh, you have to have a clear plan on how you want to manage this because it's a lot different than a traditional system. And it's really not designed for the typical, you know, seven periods a day or block schedule, but you have to work within that sometimes. So you have to think about how you want to manage it. Fostering intrinsic motivation. Uh, sometimes you'll get students that are so focused on just leveling up and XP, they'll lose some of the, that intrinsic motivation to learn. So one thing that I've done is I've incorporated 20 time. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, concept, but we've done 20 time every Friday. Uh, I focus on their research skills, their presentation skills. They, it opens up their, their it's like kind of a passion project or project-based learning. So you can incorporate that into it to get them interested in, in, uh, in something that they're intrinsically motivated about. And then also, not every student is, is responding to it. Uh, but there are some major achievements that we, we've uh, experienced through this. The first thing is engagement is through the roof. I mean, I have some kids, and you'll see that in the student commentary in a second, they absolutely love this. And a lot of it is that middle level. Okay, the kid that would have just normally skated by and got a 60 or 70, some of them are fighting to get to that top of that leaderboard. Okay, so engagement is up. Um, peer pressure? Yeah, uh, let me talk about engagement a little more before I move on to that. Last night we had parent-teacher conferences. Traditionally we have a pretty poor turnout in the district. Um, the person who had the most parents come to see them, they had 22 parents, which was, was pretty cool. I had a decent amount of parents come to me, and sometimes I'm really nervous about the night. Sometimes like parents will sit there and try to attack you. Why did you do this for my student? Why didn't you do this for my student? Last night, 12 parents, well, parents of 12 students, they all came in, and they were like, my son or my daughter loves your class. It's so engaging. They're actually like taking a liking to history, which is like, because I hated it in high school. Um, so student engagement is through the roof. And we also created an environment of positive peer pressure. Now peer pressure, we always hear that and we think the negative stigma attached to it, but we're creating a culture of learning in our classroom where if someone isn't cutting it, if they are the waste of, of rations that Lee Sheldon says, 
We have other students that are helping them along. It's not us as a teacher standing over them and saying, you better do this, you better do this. It's kids saying like, come on, don't you want to level up? Or it's their teammates because we run it, you have to be in the same level to have a team competition. And if one teammate has reached the next level and the rest of the teammates are not yet there, they're going to get ticked off because their progress is slow. So now they're working with each other and they're saying, come on, you've got to get done with this level up. I already completed this task. Here's how I can help you. It's working out great. The uh, innovation, and then discovery, the, the innovation started with that. We've uh, adopted a lot of the UDL principles of allowing multiple means of mastery of, of representing what you know. So they can innovate and they don't always have to follow our visions exactly how we design them. They can find different ways to demonstrate that they can do things. Uh, the other thing is the discovery and mastering new ways to leverage technology. I, I give that innovator badge to find out if a student can use a certain technology to learn in a new way. Okay, and, and it has to have a substantial improvement in learning. Not using technology for technology's sake, but finding some way to actually leverage the learning. So for instance, just finding a fancy way to do direct instruction, like a nice new fancy tool for, for lecturing, isn't necessarily technological innovation. It's like, how can students use a technology to learn? If they find something like that, that's awesome. I've had kids already uh, go nuts with that. Mm -hmm. And the last point we kind of already covered, but I see it in my mind. It's like someone who's trying to climb a wall and they can't reach it. There's someone who's already climbed the wall and they're reaching the hand down to help them up. And I'm not just talking about friends in the classroom. I'm talking about someone comes from another team and they help someone out across the room because they said, here, take my hand, let me help you out. I have already beaten this level, I can show you the way. I'm not gonna give you the answers, but I can show you how. And that's what we're doing when we gamify our classroom. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick look at, uh, about a, a six minute uh, uh, video of student reactions and, and reflections on our gamified classroom. Do you want the lights on? Yep. Thank you. There's different types of missions for like chapters and assignments you have to do. And the missions can be either team, which would be like your guild, which is basically the group of people you work with when you have team missions. You create a name and an avatar and it's really cool. Everyone in the class has one big main mission that's introduced by the teacher. And in that main mission are smaller objectives that you need to complete. There's XP points in the class, so it's not like graded out of 100% per um, assignment. You can level up once you get a certain number of XP points on a level, because there's going to be like different parts of a level, and once you get the required XP points, then you level up, but you do not move up until you get a set amount of XP points. I like it. It's a switch from the normal typical class. Yeah, it's a lot better because it's, it's more fun and interactive and it's it wakes you up, you know, it's like, it's a nice change. What I like about gamification, it's unique, it appeals to what kids do every day, it makes the teacher's job a little bit more fun than it already is. I'm more in a competition to get better and to more likely do my work and slack off because I'm in a competition with everybody else. It's good that we have the two the two classes like competing against each other and it's all like the same yeah. leaderboard. Does it give you like a motivation? To, yeah, like to be to be better because like there's some people that have what like three hundred not annoys. Yeah. Like yeah. And that and then there's some like, people that are still so not like, even to a hundred yeah. yet. But like seeing the people with three hundred, honestly, that motivates but, me to to do better. Yeah. Like to work quicker and to do things at home. The leaderboard's updated all the time, like live updates, he'll come around and punch in our XP points and then bang. And that way it gives us um, instant feedback, so where we're standing in the class, and that way you're more involved and you want to, you just want to do better. So the student school lets us make up our XP points and we can gain back some. Yeah. It, it makes it so it's not too easy and it's not too hard. Gamification in general, it makes it, it makes me feel like I'm actually having fun in the classroom. My, my friend Jacob told me that his friend that normally doesn't do any work whatsoever has been trying so hard to be competitive with his friends in the class and he has such a better grade because of it. 
it opens up more competition for for groups, and it makes it it gives me more motivation to actually do my work because I can actually think of it as a game. I like video games in general and adding the whole concept of it being just one big video game kind of gives me a motivation to work hard on it. And like, sure, it's not like most video games I play, but still, it's there. It keeps me interested. Team missions are awesome because you get to work together and Everyone has to contribute and come together. It's more competitive for everyone, so you want to be on the top of the leaderboard because they have leaderboards. So it's less likely for people to slack off because you kind of want to be the top person. All the assignments and the grades a lot quicker and easier. They're smaller and more condensed, so that way it's a lot easier to do them and then get feedback back on them so you know exactly where you are 100%. Uh, I really like how even if you don't do good on one section, you can make up for it in other sections with more points. I love clicking the follow up button. <laughs> I think the way that stuff can get better is have like more solo things in a level than team because certain team members they um fall behind and so it's kind of hard to catch up with each other. Yeah, sometimes it's not always up to speed because you have to pass the level before you can like go into another. And if we're doing like class activities together, you can't really do it if people are behind. I think if there was some way to make a more engaging story that all kinds of different types of people would like. Like obviously you have different cliques in school and not everybody's going to like the same exact kind of background story. They can make it more engaging. I think what could make it better would be more interactive stuff like online, like something more interactive instead of just like typing stuff and making projects and everything. Higher reward systems for completing a level like something like that. What would be a reward? Money? <laughs> Some glitches. They're just bugs. Yeah, we can we can fix them. Oh, <laughs> you try. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 dislike about gamification that it's not an actual game and definitely slow paced. What really could change about it is, you know, put more backstory into it, get more options for the work you do. Amputation is a good idea, but it still is young ages, so it could change a lot. <laughs> Alright. I love that. He's awesome. It's funny though, he's, he loves this thing more than anyone, you know, but he's also like the biggest gamer, so he's like, oh, this isn't But uh, anyway, I, I thought I got a lot out of watching that uh, from the kids, putting that together with them, uh, because it gave me good feedback moving forward, like how we would actually um, change this in the future. And one thing you saw in there that I don't think we actually introduced yet was our level up button. So, uh, one of the most popular games that kids are playing is Call of Duty. They've been playing Halo, but it's first-person shooter games. And why we've been able to gross in the billions of dollars is because there's immediate feedback. Um, in, in this age, you could argue that there's too much violence in the game, whatever your opinion is. They pull the trigger and action happens, and they could see that. Um, so this is in contrast to, like, a diplomacy game, which we were kind of talking about how it wouldn't really work. You're going to have to like try to hash out deals, and it would take so long before something actually happens, some action happens in the game. This is why the first person shooter games are so popular. So we try to do the same things. We try to give instant feedback. We try to give kids grades as soon as they complete assignments. We try to track their progress and post it as soon as it's around. So they're not waiting for report card time and guessing and wondering, what's my grade? They have the XP tally of the leaderboard going. And the level up button is one of our extrinsic motivators. They really like it. We took a sound clip from Call of Duty, and I just did my best deep video game voice to say, level up! And then we just splice it together. So now, 
this one kid you saw, he talked about how he loves it. Sometimes when kids are swiping, they're like sneakily seeing if I'm looking so they could try to press the level up button. But I'm smart and that I always have the speakers off until class starts and I'm right there watching. So when they press the level up button, that is kind of their statement, their testament to the whole entire class. <coughs> Look at me. I just completed this next level. I've moved on. I'm a first lieutenant now. And everyone stops and they clap and they cheer and they say, woo, thank you for the loud distraction. And then they get back to work. Some teachers in our hall don't appreciate it, though, because we have that thing going off. We're in the same hall, luckily, so I hear across the hall, and I'm like, yes, Driscoll's yeah. kid just leveled up. Okay, so the next level, where are we going to move with this? And, and some of the things that first I'm going to focus on is that storyline. Like, how do I make a more engaging storyline? How do I work that into it? Because a lot of the kids mention that in their commentary. Um, but the other thing that I want to do is start leveraging a few new technologies that are coming out. The main one that I think has incredible potential right now is augmented reality. And there are apps coming out like crazy that could be used in the classroom. The first one's color mix. Uh, if you guys have access to this presentation, you can check out these videos that I made at home uh, with my son and daughter. But one of them is called color mix, uh, color AR mix. This is more for elementary, but it's coloring pages that they color in and they literally come to life. So if you look here, it gets this triggered image. I'll hopefully try to get it for you guys. And we'll be able to see. The dragon is literally flying above the page, the exact color that they colored it. You guys see that? Okay, so that is the dragon that they drew. Okay, now, this can be used with like creative writing or things like that, but there's all different sheets. If you have a bird, and then some of the bird have bears, but that's just a way that you can use this augmented reality to try to engage kids. I have one good trail like flashcards that I use with my, my son, he loves them, but where I think that this could really have potential with us with gamification is Orasma. And Orasma is an app that lets you create your own augmented reality. You can create videos and images for, with this free app and tag them to any image that you have in, in space or online. Okay, and that's where I think we could really go to, to the next level with this stuff. Uh, the AR flashcards, again, that's a picture of my son, and he has the iPad. And this is the card that he's looking at. It's just a card, and that's the dinosaur that popped up. Okay, so that's his T-Rex. Okay, so when he presses it, the T-Rex roars, and he <coughs> it. Uh, so that's how he uses the air flashcards. Aris is an augmented reality uh, platform for teachers that they can use, and it's basically GPS and QR codes so that you can create virtual field trips and augmented reality. Ingress is a new game that's designed specifically with augmented reality and GPS in mind. It's actually a live worldwide game that you have to, I think it's, it's just out of beta now, right? Yeah. Uh, but they have a, a video on that and how it's set up. They're trying to be, they're not saying too much about it on purpose, but they're trying to move this into gaming. So that's why I'm trying to relate this to gaming, is we could have augmented reality videos and scavenger hunts and missions in our classrooms, in uh, field trips, so that it becomes more than just sitting on a computer. It's more in real space that they can do these things. And right here, I'll show you an example of how I tried to use the Orasma. Um, if you want to try this out and you have access to this presentation, if you just go to this link, like if you get the Orasma app, go to that link, you end up following my channel. It's kind of like YouTube. When you follow a channel, you create a class channel, anybody who downloads that has access to your ORS. So when you go to the images that I've augmented, they will show up on your device. Uh, if you're trying to get people to do this quickly, you can create QR codes that link you directly to that, that channel. So you can try that out. It's already loaded on mine. So what's nice is that I could have printed out this image or put it digitally, uh, but watch it not work out. But if you put it up to it, you see that aura? And I made a trailer video that's literally playing in 3D space. Just based on that. You see how you back all the way up here? That's just augmented on the screen. Okay? And anybody who has a phone with Orasma can get to that video. So when I say the future of flipped learning videos, you can tag videos to anything. That sandwich, <laughs> you could tag a video. I mean, it would make sense because the sandwich is going to be gone soon after you're going to eat. Lincoln, however, will not be gone unless yes. I steal them and put them in yes. my car, which I might do. You go up to Lincoln and you get some fun facts. Maybe even someone dresses up as Abraham Lincoln. So it's like the picture comes to life. It's like a Harry Potter Hogwarts experience where the pictures actually talk to you and President Lincoln tells you a little bit about his life. We're actually considering making a, uh, working with student council to make a scavenger hunt throughout the school where we have different images in the school that they have to find and then a video of a student pops up giving them a clue as where to go next. Okay, so you can set up scavenger hunts with this. I'm having my AP kids for the primary source images in our book. They're making videos explaining the parts of it. 
augmenting the image in their book. And then all the students that follow that channel for review at the end of the year can literally just go through the book and every primer sort of image, if they put their phone or tablet up to it, a video from a student in the class will pop up explaining it. Okay, so this is where this could go. And the technology is already here. We just know how to, we need to know how to use it and how to leverage that in the classroom. A lot of these iPads are in classrooms just collecting dust. Okay, so there are now more and more ways for us to start using these in either a gamified classroom, a flipped classroom, or just using this augmented reality to engage kids with, uh, say, story, uh, um, the creative writing, using stories, or flashcards, anything that you can think of. It's just the possibilities, I think, are endless for us. Now, um, the, the thing that I want to end with here, if I can get this last slide to go, is um, when you guys are trying this out, if you do decide to try out gamification, just think about how you want to structure your class. And we are big proponents of mastery learning. It doesn't have to be mastery. But at the end of the day, it's, it's more about how your kids are engaging with the content, how they're working on their skills, how they're working together, and how the technology is helping them do that. I am a, I'm really into instructional technology, but I hate using technology for technology's sake. When we went to the RIDE conference and we worked with those ed tech companies, there were some that we thought were incredible that we're going to use in the classroom, but the, some that we said, wow, that's cool, but how is it going to help our kids learn? So really, uh, some of the things you may find here that work for you, you may find others, uh, but find what helps the kids learn. That's really at the end of the day. It's not what's flashy. It's not what's cool or what's trendy or what's in the app store. It's what helps your kids learn. There it is. No, you ended it well. OK. Proud of you. All right. Uh, any questions from you guys? I have a question um, about how you set the culture and maintain the culture in the classroom. You know, when you have all the kids doing self-paced stuff for like a year, and um, you know, where, where kids move up in rank and now they're mentors, how do you how do you maintain or how do you set that culture at the beginning instead of it being, oh, you know, I'm I'm better than you because I've done I've done more, I'm smarter than you, all that sort of stuff. You, as a teacher, you, as a te exactly at the beginning of the year, how do you, how do you set and maintain? I get a lot of blowback at the beginning. Ever since I started flipping my class, that their concept of what a teacher does is direct instruction, and that's really it. So when I move back and I create a student-centered environment like this, a lot of them, their first thought is, "You're not teaching me anymore." I even had some parents come and say, "You're not teaching my son." Yeah. He said, "You don't lecture anymore." Okay, so they just kind of, it's, it's you're changing the culture to understand that you are, are, are the center of the learning here. And I'm here to help you and design and do all of this stuff I can to help you learn. But really, I'm just coaching you through. I'm providing you feedback. I'm giving you encouragement. I'm giving you challenges. But really, it's you that's learning, not me that's teaching. Yeah. Okay, because you have the, the famous line, people say, oh, I, I taught it. They just didn't learn it. Well, no, you didn't, right? If you taught it, they didn't learn it. You didn't teach it. Okay, so I think once I explain that well, then it really helps. And communication with parents is key because um, I think it was last year I had a parent of two two uh, two kids who were in my class, and she really thought that I was doing a disservice to their kids because I wasn't doing this direct instruction lecture. But I just had to convince her that no, I'm working with them even more than ever because I had time in class to work one on one with. Them. Okay, so I think communicating to the parents is important on this as well, not just to the kids. And I'd, I'd go a step further too and say. What the flip class and gamification has allowed me to do a little bit better is build a stronger rapport with my students. Because um, I'm not standing up in front of the classroom just speaking at their faces and making sure that no one else talks. Well, if they're engaged in, in their different levels, I'm moving around. And I, I call it, I think there's a book called Teach Like Your Hair's On Fire. So I tell people that I teach like my hair's on fire. If you come to my classroom, I'm constantly like running all over the place. But what I have the time to do is sit down with all of my kids. And I clocked it yesterday just because I was curious. Um, I had a couple absences, so my E-period class, and I had eight kids show up. I was able to sit down and talk with each of them for five minutes. And it's awesome. It's awesome. And I could connect one-on-one. -on -one. So when I say, hey, Jordan, this person is on level three. They're working on their challenge. Do you have any thoughts of like what we could challenge them with a the question? Then the student is, becomes the teacher. And so what we slowly start to build is the student-centered classroom where um, I was actually walking down the hall yesterday. Um, my principal was talking to me, and the bell rang. So I was in my room when the period started. I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, please stop talking. You know, I have class. I have to go to my class. I have to go to my class. And it was like a full minute. And I'm walking down the back hallway very quickly, and a student from my early morning class is walking with me. He's like, how come you're not in class? I'm like, I was talking to the principal, blah, blah. And I'm like, how much you want to bet, though, that my kids got the laptop up, 
They turned on the projector. They all swiped in, and they have their mission rundowns in front of them just waiting for the question. He goes, I'll bet you five bucks that didn't happen. Sure as heck, we walk by the room, he comes in, he pokes his head in, and everyone's just waiting. They turned and saw me, everyone had their mission rundown sheet. They had all swiped in. They had, I trained kids, if ever anything happens, if a sub comes in, here's how you turn on the laptop, here's how you turn the projector, here's how you get the file up and ready to roll. And they just did it. It was awesome. It was like the shining yeah. achievement of my year. They were like trained to perfection. And they all just turned when I walked in. And I pretend nothing happened. And I said, today's daily XP question is, why do we celebrate Veterans Day? And no one even asked, where were you? They just they got right to it. And it was awesome. And I think it's through that report that Jerry would have built through this style of class. Now, since you guys have shown results in this, are you seeing other instructors picking this up? So that now you can see consistency. Instead of a kid, before they get into your class, where you have to teach them about the student-centric model, and then they leave the class, and then they go back to the direct instructor. Are you seeing now some instructors that are taking this Well, here's over. what's great. Tom makes my life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Tom teaches sophomores in world oh, history. Gotcha. I teach juniors in U.S. history, yeah. so he kind of bears the brunt of the work for me. Yeah. What is, are, you, are more teachers in general trying this? Yeah, you know, I mean, I just wonder about it as far as, you know, from the student's point of view, you go in, like, oh, what the heck is this? This is a completely different model, and they leave, and they're like, oh, well, I love that model, now i got to go back to that. All right, shameless plug time. This book I wrote with 19 other educators Sounds good. from around the country that we just connected through social media and all that to say, how do we get these ideas out there yeah. for people that aren't on Twitter? <laughs> you know, right, so right, like, right. let's write a book. So they, you know, but the whole point is that this is exploding. Just the flipped learning network, the social network has over 17,000 teachers that are signed up for that are trying to learn flipped learning techniques. Um, gamification started to explode in the class where teachers are trying to add. Actually, the reason why I know that this is true is because a lot of the ed tech companies and learning management systems are building in gamification aspects to it. We're, we're leaning on the CEO of EDU on Go to start adding to that uh, because a lot of teachers are starting to do this and they need to manage it. What we do is not the easiest thing to do. Setting up a spreadsheet with scripts, not every teacher can do that. But if you okay. use Admodo, I used it for two years. The very best feature of Admodo as a learning management system is the badges you can award. And for the two years I used it, the kids went crazy. They got a badge for having a high test score. They got a badge for being a collaborator, team leader, and they loved it because they could see and look at each other's profiles it's lined up exactly like Facebook, social media for education. And they can see this person has six badges, and they say, how come this person got awarded a badge and I didn't? I wish I had this video real quick to show you. Has anyone seen that The Lone Nut to Leader video on TED, the TED Talk? I'll have to share that with you guys. The whole point of that is that you have you know, the person with that crazy idea, maybe innovative or not, but really until some people start following that person, they're just a lone nut. But once they start building some momentum, they become a leader even though maybe the ideas haven't changed at all. But I think with a lot, with a lot of this instructional technology, with flip learning, with students, anything, with you guys being here and going back to your districts or, or wherever role you're in, you may be the lone nut right now, but I think the momentum's changing where people are going to start following you. People are going to see that what you guys are doing in your class makes sense. And the kids, it's going to be from the ground up. I feel like even the flip learning stuff has been a ground up thing. It started out with a couple teachers and some students who liked it. Now it's a teacher-led movement that is finally working its way up into colleges. Right. But uh, same thing with a lot of these other things. If you start doing this, if you gamify your class, if you flip your class, if you start trying some of these innovative things, the kids are going to like it. They're going to spread the word. And maybe a teacher or two starts doing it. And then you kind of spread from there. I mean, I think this is going to be a tough thing for like top-down reform to happen. It's going to have to start with teachers and, and grow with teachers. And that's why I'm a big proponent of when you have PD having like tech coaching and having a more permanent access within a building of like go-to teachers to help train staff instead of just having one person come in for a session twice a year to train a whole staff, half of which probably don't care what the person's talking about. You know, so I think that that's a more organic way to have change in a district. We're working on it out in Button. Um, to give you an example, this is Glenn Rogers. He teaches yes. math at our school. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he drove all the way here from Putnam. Yes. Rock on. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's spreading. And it's it's exciting, you know. And my dad said uh, he was talking to me about this before. He's like, "Oh, this ed tech stuff and these new teaching tech things. Like, do you think it's at like you know the the, the top of the wave?" And I'm like, "Like, we're still kind of like paddling, waiting for the wave to come." You know, I think that there's a lot of people that are really dying to try to change the way they teach. They just can't, but the technologies are going to let them do that. Like, I think a lot of things we talked about today. I mean, these theories and these concepts have been around for a long time. Direct instruction and mastery was starting in the mid 70s, 60s, or 70s. This isn't new, it's just we haven't been able to pull it off yet, but these technologies are letting us do it. 
So it's just really exciting to be part of that and to work with people like all of you guys here uh, that are interested too. Any other questions? I think it would be, you guys are awesome. This is so great. Awesome. Thank you. This is awesome. Um, I think that even though a lot of this work gets kids all excited and like wanting them to do better for each other and like it pushes kids along, I think for an educator, it's like, oh my God, they're so far ahead. I don't even know how, where do I jump in? Like, how do I even, like, how do I get my foot just tapped into that water a little bit? And what, so what's the low hanging fruit? What's the easy thing someone can start with? Well, I have a bias here, but I think starting with a, a little bit of a foot learning approach, mm -hmm. starting with that, maybe archiving some of your direct instruction so you can innovate in the class. And you may not innovate with gamification. I know some incredible educators in the foot learning community that do more inquiry based, they, they call it explore foot apply, they just do a mastery system. But maybe starting with that, because that will really change your instruction. If you move your direct instruction out of the class time, that's a good entry point. And then you will have that extra class time to innovate, whether it be gamification or something else. So that's a really good starting point. Else? I'd say the easiest thing to do, bare bones, the easiest is just to change the language and yes. terminology. Yes. Just to get action verbs set up where it's actually engaging. And we're not going to learn about how US industry expanded in the 1800s. You're going to expand industry. And I'm going to tell you that with enthusiasm. The kids are going to be like, why is he so excited about something that sounds so boring? And then they get yeah. into it and they're like, yeah, because right. yeah, you don't have to gamify your whole course like we did. You could just gamify a week or a lesson or, or something. You know, And maybe have teams that say, all right, we're going to get into our guilds today for this lesson. Uh, that might be another way. It's like a lot of teachers do review games. I mean, my social studies teacher played review basketball. That's why I do review basketball. I mean, they've been playing review games and review Jeopardy. And why do teachers like review Jeopardy? Because it gets the kids jacked up. So I just do that a little more. So apply the, the review Jeopardy review to more uh, more of your lessons. So that might be a good way too. A lot of teachers already do review games. Right. So maybe start there and say, all right, let's do this review game concept. Don't wait till the last day of the unit. Maybe you start at other points. Where do you teach in Putnam? Uh, at the high school. High school? Yeah, high school. Oh, and if you're interested more about the gamification, I've been trying to learn a, <laughs> kind of rapidly as I go. I started with this book by Sheldon, um, but there's a book, actually a, a TED talk by Jane McGonigal that came out a couple years ago, and she talks about how game design theory can be applied to solve real world problems, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Uh, I, I love her TED talk. And uh, also this book, The Gamification of Learning and Instruction. Uh, I haven't gone through all of this yet, Brian's taking the lead on this one, but this gives a little bit more, I would say, kind of like the nuts and bolts of yeah. how to do it. This is this is more narrative, quicker yes. read. This is more uh, theory research. Yeah. So if you're looking for a thicker read, this is definitely for you. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, obviously, just connecting with us, uh, see how we're doing on our journey. Uh, we're going to be presenting again here, but then at, at the Foot Learning Conference next summer in June. Um, because I, I work pretty closely with, with John Bergman. He's one of the guys that kind of started all this. and. And he asked me and Brian to come and present the gamification. Because I asked him, I was like, should we do flip learning at 20 time? Because I knew that that was a big thing now, the, the passion project. And he said, no. He said, people are going to want to learn more about this. They may not know what to do yet, but they want to hear more. So I think that there is uh, some, some momentum out there to try to get some game mechanics into the class. So by all means, track us, follow yes. us. <laughs> learn from our mistakes so you don't have to make the same thing. Be like that friend who's sitting at another friend's house watching them play Mario to know when you jump down this dark pit, you die. W watch us and learn from our mistakes so you don't have to suffer through the same stuff. Yeah, I feel like a lot of this stuff, like I, I jump in first, I don't know what I'm doing, then Brian does it later and does it way better. Yeah, I let Tom make all the mistakes. Yeah, you got lead. I'm fine with that. That's right. And then he brings the energy and does the, does it well. Anyway, um, but yeah. So that, that's something that it works for us in our district. Um, but also, instead of just having PLCs in your in your school, I really suggest expanding your PLN, your network. You can connect with anybody in the world. You should do it. Um, that's how I got into the foot learning community. How I got into gamification because I contacted the people who asked me to go to the gamification conference through a Twitter post. Or it just, I mean, it's. The way that you can create connections online and then they turn into real meaningful connections face to face is, is extraordinary. In Rhode Island, that EdChat RI, I've been trying to start learning more about the Rhode Island scene, and I know that that's a way that, to, that you can connect on Twitter. But again, reach out, learn from people around the world, not just in your district. And I, I think it helps break down that silo effect. Now, that's one of the reasons I left my first job. You know, I felt like I was extremely isolated, uh, no one ever wanted to collaborate. Even my principal didn't want to come in my room, we were just saying, Oh, you know, you're doing a great job. I'll see you in June. And that, that might be okay, but, you know, I didn't have to worry about evals, but I got no feedback. I got no help. So I started to expand. I went to a district that has more people that I could work with. 
and I expanded my, my learning network through Twitter, through uh, blogging all the time, reflecting on my learning, and just making connections. So that's it, something that all of you guys can do. And just uh, be leaders in your district, be leaders where you are. Um, I know you said that you, your students are moving at their own pace. Yep. And so um, we're looking at trying to do that for the new high school that we're building. Awesome. Mastery based awesome. progression. That's incredible. But what I'm wondering is what are some of the challenges that you encounter when you come to grading time and you're talking to parents and you know their kid only completed two units and this kid has seven units and how do you even report that? Does the school support that? Mm -hmm. they're, they're graded for what they accomplish. You know, if you haven't got to level three and you haven't attempted level three, that's not going on your report card. And so far, no one's had a problem with that. When I state that I'm, I'm here to make your kid curious, I'm here to get them to inquire about things that they want to know in the world, and I'm setting them up with a toolbox of skills, and that some people are going to move slower. Everyone's okay with that. Sometimes kids complain in the class too. They say, hey, how come I had to do uh, three political cartoons? This kid only had to do two. They don't need to know. I say, I give each kid what they need. And, and parents have been okay with that, and, and faculty administration have been okay with that, um, which has been great for me because I haven't had really anyone opposing me in trying these new things, and it's been working out well so far. And we definitely like to connect with you too about that. We, we'd like to move our, our district, at least some of our classes, towards that. All right, well, thank you guys. Great job. Thanks, thanks for coming.